okay and uh, yeah so uh, what what i read was like there were five or six major highways throughout the land and there was uh, of course small roads uh, but uh, galilee happened to be most of it was uh, was part of this big uh, highway which was from uh, damascus like uh, damascus it it uh, join it linked um, uh, galilee uh, or maybe uh, the the uh, palestine to the outside world from the west uh, the link to the east so you imagine like somewhere here uh, that that part damascus and and other parts so the, there's a straight line line that link goes here it's not showing the roads and then it goes up till ptolemy so it it goes up to the coast and so that is why people in galilee it's like um, also uh, what we do not that we get only through history so there were 24 uh, sort of uh, schools of um, uh, rabbis or the temple priests so they used to gather from these 24 places and each time they had to uh, serve at the temple uh, so um, galilee was part of uh, or, or maybe nazareth was part of those those things where they gathered and then that is why uh, they also had influx of the spiritual people and gatherings there and all throughout so there were greeks there were romans there were uh, travelers from the rest of the world and and galileans uh, like they had plenty uh, the, the and and the rabbis divided it into regions like uh, upper galilee and lower galilee and and uh, it had like the coastal regions so uh, they had fish they used to export and then there were like um, a, a land full of olives and and there was export so this they compared it like uh, industrial towns how we have and there is a lot of settlement around so population was dense and, and also like like they were um, rich so there was the saying they said according to uh, this is not what I, I i am saying it's all according to the book that i've, I've read um so um yeah and and uh, people they said it is easy to uh, raise a olive group in in galilee than to raise a child in uh, jerusalem so so that is uh, what they said and and basically the land was plenty and people were more open in galilee and and they said uh, that is why when jesus preached the gospel uh, in galilee and in areas and and the miracles were performed in cana and other places in galilee the the region uh, so uh, that was the best place because if uh, it's it's there there are travelers are all, all around because of the, this big highway the, the, the great road and uh, it's possible to reach from um, to other parts of uh, palestine like judea and other places and also from uh, to the other parts of the world it will go to the west because people are traveling and all and and uh, by nature galileans were like always uh, opposed to the the romans and and there were certain verses also uh, where where we see like jesus is saying some people uh, he was informed in one of the parts in, in i think in luke uh, where where he he's informed that uh, uh, romans have killed killed some galileans so then jesus says do you think that you are more holy than them or or, or they were more sinners like you unless you repent so that and and other parts of, parts also like uh, galileans are rebelling when in in acts also uh, wait let me oh that exact was i highlighted it today oh. yeah when the apostles were opposed then somebody says you know there was uh, like acts 537 after a, a time of the consensus there was judas of galilee he got people to follow him but he was killed too and all his followers were scattered so they are thinking like that this current thing what the acts are doing maybe something like that so basically galileans were like considered hot blooded and always in rebellion against the roman empire now um let me go to the next map oh, i'm not able to exit it okay yeah so uh, what i was explaining this this thing which you see a uh, told me that that is called uh, acre in some places it's called acro in some places that is uh, the part that coastal region and and those road that that traverse and decapolis of course also at the time uh, when when jesus preached um, this is all uh, 
basically 10 heathen cities and most of the time uh, like the rabbis considered them very holy and they say we are in Jerusalem but let it be known that most of these parts there were heathen practices the cities all the names even Samaria some gods and all uh, everything had their local deities and and they were living side by side with with uh, people who were all heathens and they had their deities and other practices so uh, let me stop sharing that. And, and why I was saying that is uh, that that will help us understand uh, partly um, what was, uh, how difficult it would ha have been for the Jews to accept that the gospel is going to other places and other people will be part of, uh, uh, you know, their, their culture, what they considered was their culture. And now a little bit of history about Samaria. When uh, Samaria, uh, this I read like uh, in Wiki, uh, when the, uh, the Romans uh, uh, like uh, took over uh, the Holy Land in around uh, 135 BC or, or what? Yeah. So uh, that time uh, the, the Samaritans refused to uh, identify themselves with the Jews, to find favor with, with them. So already there was acrimony. And uh, then this book, uh, and, and it says, I think, uh, who's that? Uh, Josephus. Josephus and, and other historians, they, 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 they are uh, like Josephus is recounting an incident where um, uh, during one of the, yeah, the Feast of Passover, the Samaritans had uh, strewn some bones in the temple to defile it. So it's like that sort of acrimony. And why I explained the highway and, and things, there was a highway number four, they said, uh, which went, uh, which linked uh, Jerusalem uh, via Samaria and, and they could directly go to Galilee. But the Jews, they, they so much was the hatred that they preferred to go around, like towards the corner of, of Jordan and Bethany and those sites, they would take that road which was infested by robbers and highwaymen instead of going to Samaria. So that, that was the sort of hatred. And now the, the Samaritans also had their own Torah. There was a Samaritan Torah also. And since it was part of the Northern Kingdom, they considered themselves the, the owners of the uh, real uh, Jewish legacy and all that, and, and the real uh, Abrahamic descendants and, and uh, whatever there was the, their temple. And then one of the emperors destroyed it. And then they started worshiping the ruins and stuff. But so both of them like had, had this this sort of a, a sectarianism thing. The other uh, thing was um, degrees of holiness. So uh, Jerusalem, of course, was considered very holy. And then there was Judea and uh, Galileans, like I've, ex I've explained how they used to consider them, uh, them like uh, uh, very materialistic and, and they used to hate, hate them. So it, it's like town people hating their country, uh, country brethren. So that sort of uh, thing was there. And then, uh, yeah, so there, this is the Holy Land. Then there, there is a Holy Land and, and there is a, a sort of an outer band, uh, which, uh, which is like uh, Syria. So Syria is, uh, is part of those, those places which like uh, David had acquired and, and it include other, other countries that were captured. So Syria is not the Syria, uh, the, the region itself, but places around which were part of the Syrian empire. So that's considered a little bit uh, like, uh, uh, what's, what do I say? More acceptable than, than the rest of the world. And then there is rest of the world. And which is like uh, starts with Antioch. So, so uh, this book was saying that all that is before Antioch was sort of maybe considered, you know, like part of uh, Palestine or could be considered. But but since uh, when Antioch starts and its walls and all, all that was uh, considered um, uh, like outside and totally unacceptable and untouchable and so heathen. So uh, then it quoted that words where Jesus says, no, dust off the, the uh, when you go and preach the gospel and, and then they don't accept, then uh, even uh, remove the dust of your feet. So, so that is what they used to do. Even the dust of heathen lands, like which is not part of the Holy Land and the Syria and other places and, and those uh, places that were conquered by David and were supposed to give tithe uh, and, and, and bring offerings. So other than that, everything was heathen. And even if the dust of such lands used to enter uh, that was considered unholy and now uh, one more I forgot uh, one part to highlight in the map let me share it again so this is the division uh, uh, during uh, Jesus time of how so you see 
um, what parts were ruled. So the blue part is ruled by Herod uh, Archelaus. Uh, and uh, these are all, all sons of, of the older, the Herod one. And so this part uh, was, was ruled by Herod Archelaus. And, and then later it, it was ruled by the Roman procurators. So uh, yeah, like Roman governor Pontius Pilate. And, and this purple part was like ruled by Herod Antiochus. And then uh, this was ruled by Philip. So yeah, these are all part of the Holy Land. And um, yeah, we already know that like this Philip is the one who uh, whose wife Herod took away and, and then uh, all that. So uh, yeah, now let me uh, begin how the gospel is, is spreading and, and what the uh, article says. So uh, let me stop sharing the screen because that's what I, I've highlighted from the book. Um, so yeah, uh, as I showed in the map, so the persecuted uh, believers were driven out of Jeru Jerusalem after Stephen's martyrdom. And it ended uh, with the church being established in um, Antioch in Syria. So as I've already explained that uh, until uh, that part, Syria was like sort of acceptable and, and uh, the outer fringes of, of um, Palestine. And um, then, uh, so what we see here, the article is saying from a rather rural movement of small communities, now it's spreading to a cosmopolitan center of Antioch and Antioch was the third largest city in the Greco-Roman world after Rome and Alexandria. So of course, Rome, because it's the capital and Alexandria, and this is the third largest city in the Greco-Roman world. And, and how, why this is important now? Yeah, so these are all the, now the coastal regions. This is all scattered around the coast, coast as in the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, because Mediterranean Sea is on the, uh, what do you say, the, the west, and, and these are all uh, lying on the uh, edges of uh, all these cities where the gospel is being preached. So now it's broken down religious, social, and ethnic barriers, which we briefly discussed. And now people on the fringes of Judaism, including Gentiles. So uh, uh, please note that it the, the section that we are dealing with now is not, an, uh, so far it's not reached the rest. It's not like what is considered the rest of the world or, or the out, outer world. It's still people on the fringes of Judaism that are being uh, considered here. And uh, yeah, like we all know, that um, Christians, uh, uh, like now they have their ident identity when it reaches Antioch. Um, this is when they are called Christians. And it's no longer the followers of the way, or like they said, it's a sect of Nazarenes who are stirring up some trouble. So, so that, that is what has happened. And um, now this section is also dealing with the uh, ministry of Philip as the evangelist, uh, who's going to Samaria and Judea. And, and the conversion of Paul, when we see, and, and his ministry in, in Tarsus and Damascus. And um, then Peter, how he travels, and John along with him to Samaria. And, and then uh, also he travels alone to Joppa, Lydda, and Caesarea. And then uh, a dispersion of other Hellenists, Hellenists to the regions of Phoenicia, Cyprus, Cyrene, and Antioch. So all this, uh, the article is saying, took place between a period of uh, 12 to 13 years. So um, uh, now it's explaining the ministry of Philip. So Philip, as we see, like Stephen was the seven who distributed food to the Hellenistic uh, widows. And the net result of Philip's ministry was that many Samaritans believed and they were baptized in the name of Jesus. That is in Acts 8, 12. So uh, I think uh, I, I should sh start sharing the presentation again, maybe, so that we have the right maps everywhere. Okay. Yeah, so like that, oh, sorry. Can I go back? Okay, so like we see, see uh, all these are Judea, Samaria, 
and, and all those places, even uh, Antioch. This is all around um, what they call the Great Sea or the Mediterranean Sea. So it's spreading along those coastal lines. And, and that's what the article is uh, also saying, Judea, Samaria, Galilee, and the coastal regions. So uh, now we, if we move on to the next, which is the ministry of Philip. So, uh, yeah, and, and what is it saying? I like, I'm not covering, I'm just paraphrasing uh, what all uh, is being written about ministry. Philip's ministry. So, uh, so you see the region and just above, uh, like north of uh, uh, Judea is Samaria. So, as a re result of Philip's ministry, there many people are believing and they they are baptized. So, and then uh, Peter and and John have uh, come, and and then uh, so uh, the purpose. Uh, this article is saying of Luke is is not to intend. See, like like we read in the articles. We cannot make patterns out of these things. And it's not that he's implying that the Holy Spirit can be uh, transmitted by some rites of confirmation by the apostles. This is just that maybe he wants to highlight uh, the, uh, or link the this baby church to the mother church in Jerusalem. And it's not implying that uh, to receive the Holy Spirit uh, or the apostles need to be there. And um, now... Uh, Luke, uh, like in, in the general way that he gives summary, he, he's saying that they proclaim the good news to many villages of the Samaritans while uh, like they've laid hands uh, on the Samaritans and, and the Holy Spirit has come down. So Peter and John, while returning, they're preaching to the uh, other villages in Samaria. So now we know that the gospel has spread to different parts of Samaria. Now, um, the next part uh, is yeah, uh, where... Another part it's saying of uh, Philip's ministry is on the wilderness road between uh, Jerusalem and Gaza and the ancient city uh, and Gaza. Gaza is an, uh, is an ancient city near the coast of uh, uh, the southern border of Judea. So you can see it from the map, the southern coast of Judea, there is Gaza and, and that desert road, uh, like from Jerusalem, one has to go down the desert road to Gaza. And then that uh, it's written below to Egypt and Ethiopia. So that is where he's meeting this uh, Ethiopian eunuch. And uh, this is probably a God-fearer, the article says, uh, who's using this opportunity. Maybe he, he's like, uh, he, because he's the queen's uh, person. So he, he maybe used this opportunity or trip for a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. But, uh, and, and they're saying that it's very expensive to have a copy of Old Testament, at least the book of Isaiah, but uh, so, because it's very rare and ex expensive. So then what happens is he starts explaining uh, uh, Isaiah 53, 7, 8, Christologically. So he brings in um, Jesus as the Messiah there and he proclaims the good news and, and the necessity of water baptism. And uh, then after that, he is swept off to the city of Azotus. So that also we see like straight in line uh, above uh, on the coastal line only above Gaza is ex uh, Azotus. And um, yeah, and then he continued to preach uh, the line as the essay, uh, preach, preach to the towns of the regions between uh, Azotus and his final steps to Caesarea. So that, that straight line, which is going up and up, it's like the gospel is being preached along all those lines until um, he's reached Caesarea. Now, uh, one point to be noted uh, is uh, uh, for those times that Luke may not have a clear idea about the geographical relationships between Galilee, Galilee uh, Samaria, and Judea, because um, those times uh, people uh, did not have access to maps publicly. And only military and political leaders uh, had those uh, which were produced and they were guarded uh, properly. So um, Luke is more concerned with a clear pattern than exact geographical regions. So we should also not, you know, when we read all this or this big article, and though it says geographical expansion, uh, we do not need to uh, burden ourselves with too many, oh, where exactly what, how many miles and stuff. Purpose is to just tell what all regions were being covered. And then why he uses the story of Philip is, uh, not just the transition from Jews to Gentile, yeah, and, and it's bef before even the conversion of Saul takes place and then his ministry to the Gentiles and he's become like the apostle com commissioned to go to the Gentiles. So uh, Samaritans were called semi-Jews and were on the periphery of Judaism, as we had discussed, 
so th that was like okay still like in the jewish um, purview but now the ethiopian treasurer was a gentile uh, was probably a gentile god fearer or a proselyte who was on, a, on the way home from a pilgrimage to jerusalem and and this this is actually saying the eunuch's uh, homeland which is ethiopia is situated literally at the ends of the earth so and and it's like uh, see how many uh, cultural and regional boundaries or ethnic boundaries the gospel has jumped now because he's a black african he is a jewish sympathizing uh, gentile he's a queen's treasurer so it's like a political elite and also he's he's a castrated male so according to judaism it was like somebody who's impure and disgraceful and forever cut off from the covenant community so this is what um, uh, like like in in today's time you know people talk about equal opportunities and rights and and recognition of everybody so like all those people they could like say that this, that this is totally on the point and and these marginalized people and somebody who would be looked down upon or not even considered you know worth it uh, now the gospel has been preached to such a person and then next to jerusalem it's saying caesarea was also an important city in Palestine and and like I said, uh, this is not to be confused with Caesarea Philippi, uh, which was the third uh, largest city in, in the Greco-Roman world. This is very much a part of an important city in Palestine. And then Caesarea eventually becomes the permanent resident residence of Philip and his four prophesying daughters. And the references Acts um, twenty one eight and. Um, and now uh, he's giving a historical reference here. In addition to Peter's experience in Caesarea, the church history uh, identifies uh, continuity of the Christian community in Caesarea. And then other historians are saying origin, uh, circa um, 185 to 254. Um, so it's saying that a famous school and library was there and it, it uh, like compiled the, uh, some edition of the Old Testament. And then the Vulgate also uh, was based on that when um, somebody, Jer Jerome, he worked on a revision of the Latin Bible. So basically, it became a, a, a father, yeah, a, a major region in the first century. And there was a vigorous Christian community here in Caesarea. Uh, moving on now, uh, three to two of this article, uh, it starts explaining the ministry of Peter. So maybe I think that's the next thing in the map. Oh, no. Okay, so no, not, not this map right now. I think I'll have to stop sharing. This way. And stop sharing. And um, so it's it's saying the, so Peter, uh, it's calling it Peter's tour of inspection among the uh, coastal Christian centers. Because he's going there, uh, and and like uh, we, we read earlier, he's he's gone uh, from Jerusalem to those people, and they receive the Holy Spirit. And then, um, so who are the Christians there? So some of them could have been the disciples of in these coastal regions, disciples of Jesus, and probably they had fled from the persecution of the church in Jerusalem. While others may have been a result of uh, Philip's evangelism in the the area, and. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so then, uh, wait, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, then he goes to uh, the disciples and then in, in Joppa, and then uh, he um, raises from the dead this uh, woman who's called Tabitha or Dorcas. So that is the outline of what Peter is doing here. And, and then it explains Jerusalem is 25 miles uh, uh, from uh, Jerusalem. Lida is 25 miles. Then Joppa is 10 miles from Lida. And then again, it's 25 miles to Caesarea. So uh, those sort of things. And um, Peter uh, it's, it's also saying Peter stayed in Joppa with Simon the Tanner. So again, it's somebody who's considered uh, unclean and unpleasant. But then uh, it's like... Um, Maybe it's like sort of a prelude to Peter's next episode with Cornelius, uh, who's a um, Roman centurion. So again, it's like um, the gospel is still going. And then there's this issue of clean and unclean foods. 
so um lida uh, old in the old testament and and jo power approximately 10 miles apart and these uh, coastal cities had a mixed population of greek and jewish citizens so um so luke is probably trying to uh, tell us deliberately that the gospel is going beyond uh, judaism here and um, then uh, yeah and and then it's saying that jews and gentiles now can fellowship together because no persons are profane or unclean and and this is a radical reversion uh, reversal of what peter and all the apostles had been uh, like taught and believed and practiced in the orthodox palestine uh, jew um, scenario and um, and now it says uh, the gentiles it's shown that the gentiles can also become members of the church through faith and baptism and this is a uh, significant development in christianity and uh, according to god's plan even the gentiles are in so yeah and and now it, it just explains uh, that you know then there is a uh, silence or uh, the last time uh, peter's uh, missionary activities are mentioned in acts 11 and then uh, he's he's seen participating in the Jew jerusalem council but then it it says that all this time um, he was also like he continued to preach the gospel and uh, uh, probably he was located in antioch and he served as a missionary to the circumcised there accompanied by his wife and um, traditions also claim that he died as a martyr in rome around ad 64 during the reign of nero so um, that and then uh, now it says the description uh, that luke is giving is moving on to the next phase in the emergence of church which is uh, involving paul so um, yeah i think that's the last section and uh, i'm not sure how much detail i should go into but uh, it says the early activity of paul, <coughs> paul so he is introduced to the believers in damascus by ananias and uh, then briefly he preaches and then he escapes from jewish opponents so, to the damascus so yeah so let us uh, let's just uh, summarize kind of whatever you have spoken to us till now any queries questions how many of you were actually able to read this part at least till uh, the early activity how many of you have been reading i could read up to uh, peter's Just to where uh, Sister Shuba stopped just now. Okay. To that part, I have. Uh... Yes. Anybody else who are reading? Yes, Pastor. Here also. Okay. Good. Printo, Donna. Uh, Pastor, I actually read uh, till Victor's Pastor Victor uh, what he taught. Then also, then my uh, topic from uh, Jerusalem to Rome. I didn't uh, started uh, what Shuba just uh, came on. Anybody else read? Yes, Pastor. Till uh, Philip's ministry, I have read. Alrina. Pastor, I didn't read. Honestly, I'm sorry. I'm very busy. Angel. Skimmed over. I'm again just starting here. Just skimmed over. Uh, I was okay. Missing. Let me do a small little lecture for all of us here. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I want to remind us that we are in a course. It is important that you set aside five hours a week. Otherwise, you won't be able to complete the course. But five hours of reading is enough. I mean, with that five hours, you won't finish it initially. It won't happen. But still, the fact that you read uh, or you come prepared a reading. Now, when I divided this whole autopsy to every one of you, uh, the idea is not to read only your part. It is to read through the whole, uh, the whole, uh, uh, the the chapter or the article, 
through and through, word to word, you know, paragraph to paragraph, page to page, going through with it along with the reading of the Book of Acts. Now, I, I really like the way Shubhasa started. She not only read the Bible, she not only read the other parts here, she also went and tried to understand for the culture at that time. And so probably in your uh, location, where in your part of your presentation, where which part of whichever part in the journey of Acts, you can go a little more deeper and share with your fellow colleagues that you know what you learned in terms of um, additional learning. But it is important that all of us uh, work through the book of Acts with Patsia. And also, I have also let you all know that as you are doing this, you need to have a Word document that is constantly having points put in so that tomorrow when you are going to write the, uh, the competency paper, you should be able to fill in it easily and that they may be able to. So uh, the, uh, the trend that I'm seeing right now, the trend that I'm experiencing now is, is you know, this, we could have a completely crashed batch who will not complete the program, uh, who will not, who will eventually get backlog. So I need all of us to get to the point of reading the articles, reading the work. I know that there is challenges. If you are a busier week, then you need to compensate the next week. Take off, maybe. I've done many times. I've just taken off, sat two days and completed my work. Or I put in additional one hour and at night, everybody goes to sleep. I'll sit additional and work and finish it. So it is important that we finish our work. It's important that we read. Now, uh, I'm, I'm going slow right now. Okay, because I know that you're all trying to figure out the course. So I'm going very slow at this point. I'm also very, you know, at this point, very uh, you know, lenient in terms of the speed. and But after some time, we start to speak up speed and you will start to see that we are finishing unit after unit very fast. Here we are still in unit one. We are still trying to, so that every one of you will be able to get a grip of the course. But that's not the speed we are intention, in, intending to. And of course, Artipatia is a foundational article. So really want you to go through the article. So we, we are all admitted to a course. You all got your admission. We are committed to the course as we are committed to Christ. There's an equivalent in that. Uh, we are committed to the people who are sponsoring our course. Um, and we are committed to each other. That's the most important that we are committed to each other to see that we together can finish this course. Now, I had in the earlier batches many who fell off, never made it, and they had to be moved out of this batch, out of the batch, and then put back to a uh, you know, uh, um, actually, many more were supposed to join here who are still not uh, joined, who are from the senior batches, but they have already attended many of the classes. But I put them in this batch because if they attend along with this batch. They are able to review and finish their articles, which they are not doing instead. So it's unfortunate that we are not able to remain committed to the course. It's like, you know, you get married and then you have to remain committed to your wife. You can't go after every other girl that is along the way or every other man along the way. So in the same way, you are, we are committed to this course. That means till the end of this course, you have a commitment to see you put in an amount of time. Now, I'm not saying every, now I give an idea of one hour of a day to see that you are doing this. And I also gave the idea that you don't need to put an extra time. Uh, use use your white time time and things like that to engage the uh, text and the scriptures. And so your study becomes part of your, you know, quiet time thing and your reading of the scriptures becomes part of that. So that you don't have to additionally pull out time. Uh, so um, remaining committed, you know, giving that type of time to the course is very, very essential. Otherwise, I can assure you after six months, instead of going to Pauline, you'll be going back to doing the book of Acts again. So it's just not like going to make sense for you because the idea is to finish the course at least to certificate of ministry by, you know, uh, you know at least in two, two and a half years. Don't prolong the course. Don't, uh, and the whole idea of learning, you know, the whole idea of understanding and the whole idea of uh, developing a framework within you that you know you start to understand the scriptures completely different, completely uh, different from the way that 
uh, is not the way you had understood it earlier, not from a devotional angle, but you are able to see it from a very constitutional and missional angle, which will enrich you as far as most of you are involved in ministry. Here. And so if I look at the picture, all of you are involved in ministry. Here. So it will suddenly push you up one notch or several notches with your understanding of ministry itself. So you need to make the force an integral part of your life. That's the most important thing. It has to be a significant priority in your journey. Uh, for that, maybe you will have to make compromises on other things. You may have to compromise on other things. Hey, I've taken this commitment to this course. I need to put in this time. I may have to stop something else. Okay, not of much lesser priority. So that you can finish the course in two and a half years. That's the most important thing. Please don't prolong the course. You can do six months off. We are doing a course every six months. So we have four courses to finish. So you are looking at uh, 24 months, you're supposed to finish off. The, at least two years are supposed to finish, but I'm giving another, I'm putting it two and a half years. You should finish at least this season. So I like everyone to share your difficulties. If a week was very difficult for you, no problem. You just need to compensate that. Suppose you missed the five hours in a week. You need to capture that five, next that lost five hours in the next week so that you need to put probably a 10-hour thing inside. Now, the best way to do is for all of us who are working is put in a leave, sit from morning till evening and cover it up so that you are completing your course. Yes, brothers and sisters. Let us hear thoughts. Pastor, I was actually on leave yesterday, so I read, read all this and completed. Yes. I did the same thing. I had to sometimes take off and sit and finish the course. Pastor, mine is like I missed the train. I'm catching up, <laughs> running behind the train. <laughs> no problem, so, Pastor. It's all about reading Acts and reading Narta Pazia. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to get it soon, Bas. Yes. If you create the discipline now, all through the course, you'll keep it going. And you'll have this excitement. Now, in the senior batch, you have Daisy, Suma, uh, Robin, at, you know, at, at Joshua, all of it. And going at a neck to neck, it's like a fun racing there, you know, Grand Prix racing. It's like they're racing through. They're all investing time, learning. Uh, they're all, you know, writing the competencies at a very significant pace. And the fantastic material is coming out of it. So you, you've not yet there started writing your first competency. You're supposed to start preparing it. But it's a very early stage in the course. If you don't build a discipline right now, the rest of the course is a crash. Building discipline into the goal, into the uh, patterns of life that you have, the rhythms of life that you have right now, it is important to slowly incorporate the course time into it. Yes, let's listen to some difficulties. How many are finding it difficult to keep one hour a day? Uh, Pastor, I actually find it difficult. Uh, you uh, gave us a solution like whenever you are having a quiet time, you can invest your time. But what's happening is like uh, maybe uh, we, we pray more and uh, uh, we read less. This is what is happening. Mm -hmm. So I'm not able to compensate uh, like per one hour per day in that manner so the only motivation i'm getting is okay i need to present so i need to prepare so that's why i was reading my portion i understand but that's a dangerous trick yeah. please don't stop praying 
<laughs> but we need to, at least you and your wife are there together. So that's a kind of close level motivation that you have. At least sitting together and reading the book of Acts and sharing your thoughts and reading out the chapter together. It's a nice, not only it becomes an exciting journey, probably even a romantic journey for you both. <laughs> but, but you need to you know, get to the point of giving one hour of reading. I'm not talking about reading the article alone. That could include the uh, important aspect of reading the scriptures. If you read the book of Acts itself and go take Patsya along with that Acts, I think that's that will establish you. You don't have to even go to the level of what Shubha has done of going beyond the Patsya and reading uh, other thick material, which is good. I mean, many of the people, I have myself done a lot of these extra uh, work that just to have understanding, geographical basis, cultural basis, and uh, all those things are good. I mean, if you can really because this is this is a course that you're doing is isn't it if you are studying a course you would go to the library and explore as much as possible now jeff doesn't ask you to do that also jeff has given you what you need to read jeff has not said okay like in a classical bible college okay you need to finish the book uh, emergence of the church and write your summary on that no jeff is not doing that jeff is giving you one page in one article one chapter in that book and saying hey read this okay so we have to get to the point of reading. There is no other way out of this. Yeah. So how, how will you do this, Pinto? Now, how will you work this time into your uh, uh, life? It's a good thing. I'm just using you, Pinto, at this point as a scapegoat. But let's... <laughs> so um, what we are doing this morning, we will pray and uh, evening time, like we have our own Bible study. So... Uh -huh. Um, with Elijah and story, we are actually having a combined Bible study. So that's with the uh, Colossians uh, chapter. So um, before that, actually, I'm planning like uh, already when this course started, like me and Donna were discussing very vigorously regarding acts and everything. Then in the long run, like that, uh, uh, I mean, that motivation got deviated to uh, different things. So um the main thing is like discipline so that's one major thing actually we need to uh take in care of or start doing okay so at least if half an hour from my side minimum or from half an hour side from her side uh, we both can actually uh do a discussion this is what i'm planning okay good now uh, you have a study every day with uh production study with uh yeah, actually, Colossians we started very recently, but before that, we were starting from uh, Genesis and we were continuing that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Colossians, uh, since we uh, our church is actually having a uh, combined um, like a discussion on twenty uh, seventh of this uh, this month, so that's why like we thought of doing that uh, in focus of uh, come for the coming uh, meeting. Okay, that's good. I mean, what your church plans don't always go upset that. Uh, and but you to don't put aside that to do this. You know, you need to find extra time to do. For example, it's very simple. You need to probably one day take a leave and sit back and don't do anything else. Don't even eat on that day. You know, just from morning till evening, read off. And and it's great, good to read in that one shot. Uh, setting because it helps you to grasp much better if you were to do it in one shot. For example, reading the Arthur Patsy article one in one shot or reading the book of Acts in one shot really helps you. So it may require you to take a half a day leave or a full day leave to sit and uh, finish off if you are not able to find time on a, uh, on a daily basis. It is important. There is no other way. It is. Otherwise, you will end up backlog then you will not be able to finish the course let me explain this to you again now imagine you are still grappling with unit one and the course has reached unit five and you all have you now upgrading to Pauline. okay you're going to the next uh, course six months from now and if you are still grappling with the unit one uh, the we don't believe in promotions and all but if you have not submitted competencies, then I will ask you to continue with the acts again. Okay. 
and I cannot put you to Pauline because what happens is you are just piling backlog over the whole thing, which is crazy because it is like a mountain you will never cross. It's like a mountain you will never cross because it's not possible. So don't allow the pile up to happen. Yeah. I'm going, I'm just going very slow at this point because I know the challenge you're going through of getting uh, the discipline of the course into the situation. You may need to talk to your pastors and say, see, I'm doing this course. I need time to do this course. And it requires, because all of them are on the course, by the way. So they also know the, the kind of commitment that is required to finish the course. So uh, you need to probably tell your uh, say pastors and your mentors to see that they are, I, I'm doing this course. I want to see that I finish this course. I need to keep the time aside. So, uh, of course, the pastors cannot compromise on what they have planned out. So it is important for you to uh, balance these things such that I know that most of the church network in, under, what is on, uh, all of you are working with uh, the network here in Bangalore. I know that there is a lot of reading, studying material, and there is a lot of activities going on. Very good. But you also need to see that if you put aside a time to finish this course. And this is also part of the grander uh, discipleship uh, process that we have put in place for all of our networks together. And with all of you being leaders, we want you to go through this course so that you are all brought into the way of Christ and the apostles. And we have all of the churches and networks will move into uh, a particular way of ministry that we see in the early church. That's the idea that we are going through. So it's not just, uh, for example, I'm taking Printo's example. It's not a Printo studying to get a degree. That's not what we are looking at. It is Printo who is now will eventually become uh, an apostolic leader who will lead the church or the church networks or assist in the uh, whole leading of the network or the leading of church in the way of Christ and the apostles. Can you see the way, paradigm that we are looking at? Unfortunately, in Indian context, we join for a course, then it is about me and I passing that course, right? So that I'll get a better job or I'll get I'll do a certification to get a better job. The idea is similar, except the fact that uh, it is not about me. It is about how God wants to use me in developing people and communities in the way of Christ and the apostles. That's the that's the most important thing. So in, in you doing the course, there is a responsibility also to the community that you are going, you will be serving in seeing that you are established in a particular way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, because I, I can sense the, the challenge in the uh, group even now at this point, at the early stage. I, and I know that all of you need to break, open, break through this you know, difficulty challenge, time challenge that is there. Uh, to see that you're able to do this. For example, I have done, um, for me, Saturdays and Sundays are the busiest, but I've taken off uh, some Saturday, I'll just finish my morning uh, first principles class and then I'll just sit till the evening and don't do anything else but sit and finish my competencies. So unless you create that discipline right now, that means to say, um, you know, I used to keep it like this, you know, when at one point, I wanted to see I submit a competency every week. So I started to read at that pace to submit a competence. That means doing a full unit in a week, reading articles and sitting through the scriptures and doing the biblical theology and submitting. You don't need to do it at that pace. You need to do it at least at the speed of one submission a month. If you do one submission a month, there are five units for you. Five submissions in five months, you will finish your X course. Okay. But initially, that you have a little difficulty, little challenge to start off and things like that. It's about, uh, you know, before marriage, you now Printo had only one week. This thing. Printo had to take care of himself, only Printo. So, Printo, I'm using you, please, for keeping up. Okay. But then, now Printo got married to this wonderful woman, Donna. Then, Printo has to make time for. Donna also. Printo cannot live his life the way he lived earlier. He has to make time for Donna. In the same way, when you got admitted to this course, it was just Printo and Donna and the ministry. And now Printo has to now make time for the course. 
And that's where the challenge is coming. Am I right, Tanda? Yeah. Okay, now we have just started acts, right? Today I'm taking second half, the idea of map, motivated abilities pattern, the first assessments that you're supposed to do. And that's going to bring the weight again up. So I need you all to time it out very well. It's very, very important. If you need to, please sit with your pastors and work through it because all of them are on their course. So they know what the situation is. Not that all of them are successfully doing the goals. Some of them have fallen off the grid, but uh, they understand. They, they, are, they are also excited that you're doing the course. Some of them you know, some of them only motivated you to join the course. So they need to also work with you to see that you are able to finish the course. Yes, anybody else? Thank you, Bruno. I'm sorry, I'm, I mean, I had to use you as an example. No, yours no. Is, but yours is an ideal example, actually. Okay, others, tell us, tell me the challenge. Share the challenge with the community. Aldina, let's start with you. So you're not yet married, so right now you need to make space only for the course. Ah. <laughs> Nothing first time, usually, okay, this is last two weeks have been bad, so I didn't get some time to read and I wasn't really able to concentrate. It's not like I didn't try, but I didn't concentrate, but I'll finish it. Don't worry. <laughs> yes, good, good. Yeah. So you can make time, right? Uh, yeah, I will try to make time. Just give me five minutes. Yeah. Shubha sister, can you please repeat the name of the book you were referring? Uh, sure, Angel. Uh, let me just go to, and in fact, I'll I'll send you all screenshot also. But let me open Scribe. And... Actually, I don't know how to pronounce the name of that guy. Wait. Um, Maybe you can. Uh, yeah, I'll I send you the, the main thing. The... Angel, I sent it in the group. Okay, thank you.
Okay. Shubha, you can continue. Uh, first, yes. I think, uh, yeah, except for the Ministry of Call, everything was over. But yeah, if you want, I'll, I'll hi read out whatever I've highlighted like here. Uh, so you have to, Ministry of Call, you're stopping with 3.3, huh? Yeah? Yeah, I mean, I, I can continue. I can go on. Like, I thought it was getting too long. So I'll continue. No, 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 no. It's not. That's part of our course. Okay. Okay, okay. So I just, I just so, talked to kind of get everyone started up again to think seriously about the course that is part of the early process of the course. So, so um, yeah. By the way, I, you, I, I, I want to give you an example of a person by name, a pastor by name, Arun, who studies with me in my cohort where I study. My cohort started in 2017, okay? Where I study. It is in only 2021 I got admission. I'm sorry, 2020 we got admission. Okay? Almost three to four years I did not have admission when I was studying. So we could not submit the articles and things like that. 2022, he is still doing Acts Competency 1. And if you were to interview him, he would just tell you that, you now we have all we have all finished, I finished my CMN, I finished Acts, I finished Pauline, I finished Essentials, I finished Leaders, I submitted the articles, I submitted uh, this thing, I got my degree also. He's still doing Competency 1. And he's not able to go forward because he is going through a paralysis of his uh, psychology, his psych, because he's not able to look at this mountain and ever finish it, especially now others are finishing it. So don't get into that place. Don't get to a place that you will not be able to, the, the, the river is too deep to plow, uh, cross, I'm not able to, I'm struggling, I'm not be able to make it because once it starts to pile up, then you will not be able to move forward. Unless you make decisions, clear, clear, decisive steps to see that you finish your competencies. Okay, please continue, Shubha. Uh, yeah, one more thing, Pastor. Uh, thanks for sharing all those links. Like I was able to watch Peter and Paul movie's first part. And that also like was, was so nice, like uh, how they're suddenly getting scandalized when Peter visits Paul in those those like one of the churches. And then everybody is, is sitting at a banquet and they've laid a huge feast. And then, uh, and so like uh, to watch everything like that and how, uh, Paul is coming and he wants to know from Peter about Jesus, his visit to Jerusalem. So a lot of things are very clear. I only watched the first part, but uh, I think it would be good, you know, it will help us because they're showing all the dates and everything. And... Any of you saw any of the movies? Did you have access to I Paul? Saw, and... Yeah, that's right. I, I saw Paul the emissary only that part and I think something helps a little bit and I couldn't, I was very busy this week actually. Yeah, yeah. No problem. Anybody else saw Peter and Paul? Did you have access to the video? Uh, Peter and Paul, I think there was a difficulty in accessing the video. But, Initially it was showing an error. Okay, but then eventually then you got it. Again. Yeah. Can you download the video and did you get an access to download it? That I did not check that. Too. Okay, yeah. How do I, if I have to download it and keep it, if anybody has an access to uh, download it? Somebody shared the link. I think Jason shared the link, right? Yeah. Jason? Yes, Pastor. Is that possible to download from where you are? I'll have to check, Pastor. I'll check and I'll let you know. Yeah, because I want to download that movie and keep it. Okay. Anybody else were able to watch any of the movies? A wonderful thing if you can why i'm giving you all these things is if you watch the movie watch the uh, bible project summary videos um read acts uh, do arthropathia it's like why why is that important because everything play, you know kind of builds the foundation on which you're going to do this course if you do acts really well the rest of your course is easy it is you know the the Pauline and everything becomes very easy for you to grasp because you know the timelines, you know the journey, you know what happened in each location. If Acts becomes like the back of your thing, Acts is like an index to all that happened in Paul's ministry. All the letters all fit into Acts actually. So if you're able to get the timeline of Acts, if you're able to get the whole journey of Paul, if you're able to find figure out what 
the spirit of god was doing in the early church it forms an excellent foundation for you to build up if you crash it here and you study it only to present or study or only to write the competency the rest of the course can be very difficult so please put in effort whatever i am recommending please try and stick to that watch the movie if not all the movies at least peter and paul because peter and paul would give us it's like a documentary of the whole uh, book of acts or there is the extensive movie three hour acts movie if you watch that that's also that also gives you almost an entire uh, documentary feeling of the book of acts okay shubha take on uh, so yeah the early activities of paul and um, though i have focused on the acts a lot of references are given from galatians and and the word mentioned here is galatians 1 uh, 17 to 21 so um paul's religious uh, exp- like um, luke is recording here paul's religious experience and baptism so it's it's in acts chapter 9 and how he introduces the belief yeah then his introduction to the believers in damascus by ananias and um, then uh, uh, it's saying um after briefly preaching the gospel uh, uh, preaching mission he uh, escapes from jewish opponents in damascus later on in the article it will explain what has happened and why and all that and then he makes a history tea trip to jerusalem where he meets barnabas and other disciples and and now uh, these uh, certain hellenistics because of the the confrontation this danger to his life so that is why uh, he sent from jerusalem to caesarea and then to his hometown that's that's in tarsus and um, so uh, after that like all this has happened uh paul is uh, is being used actually and groomed or whatever or he's uh, you know acquiring knowledge and all this and several years have passed and then finally barnabas knows that you know he is competent enough to be summoned for the mission and to accompany him to antioch which is acts 11 and uh, 25 to 26 and they serve there in, for an entire year and then again uh, you would remember there was this famine happening in jerusalem and which again the movie captures a little bit in detail how people are you know calling out and then there's like everybody starving for food so um then they make a trip to this fa- uh, with the famine relief offering and then they return to antioch uh, with john mark and then rest of the uh, acts is focusing on paul's uh, missionary journey of paul and barnabas to cyprus and southern regions of asia minor and then paul's role in the jerusalem council his agian ministry his return to jerusalem and then uh, his arrest in jerusalem and trial in caesarea and his final volume to rome a uh, voyage to rome for uh, imprisonment and trial so but that that's not uh, what we dealing with he is just mentioned the different uh, stages in his missionary journey and now uh, so um it's saying that um uh, Uh, some years of his life uh, luke is silent about so what is happening during all these years uh, and then it's saying that we should note that paul was moving about uh, the regions of uh, syria and sicilia proclaiming the gospel and connecting with uh, existing congregations so a lot of people have tried to um, chronol put that in a chronology but here there's a table given by hengel and schwemers uh, of paul's unknown years so um you could refer it to i mean i didn't didn't present it or put it in uh, my presentation but this figure 4 and it's a table so it's saying ad 33 to 36 um that's three years time paul is converted so it's mentioned in acts 9 and galatians 1 because of course he's using his testimony in places where he mentions how he like last time pastor said uh, uh, he gives a full recounting of his testimony and how he met jesus and stuff so there and then paul in damascus and nabatean kingdom i i don't know that's again mentioned in uh, galatians 117 and then paul's brief 15 day visit to peter and james in jerusalem that's mentioned in acts 9 so this is shubha uh, in your uh, map the nabatean region was shown oh okay put up your maps okay. it is there Uh, one, of your map, one of your maps. One of your maps. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll you need to understand. You need to understand where it is the Nabatean region, so you will kind of figure out. Uh, okay. 
it's it's so so small wait uh, in in the ones which i showed outside the presentation then i searched from them yeah it's right outside Phine the finishia finishia it is down uh, uh, let's say at 4 o'clock oh yeah yeah i got it i got it i'll share it again uh, i got it this morning so i didn't read the entire map so it is predominantly can you see nabatia below it's arabian region uh this this region oh arabia so, below the dead sea right below the dead sea yes the nabatian region so where did paul actually meet jesus paul met jesus in uh, damascus where is damascus damascus is uh, syria top up there no uh, can you see, like, can you see damascus map. is there is there in that map is, is that damascus on top there uh, yeah oh yeah oh, and there's one road also which is leading there uh -huh. straight 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 that road goes down arabia and then nabatia okay so you know what he's talking about now. okay he yeah it's yeah. he meets uh, jesus in damascus he is disciple there by ananias and the church there and then because of danger he moves out he travels around this arabian region and he engages with the communities that know for example uh, as he is traveling probably decapolis why is decapolis important because there was this man man who was healed by jesus or i think delivered by jesus who goes and preaches in the 10 cities decapolis you know that was that uh, particular incident right yeah. so there were communities already that were there that had an experience of jesus he was engaging with those communities yes. scholars say and then he went eventually to tarsus isn't it from there he went to judea and the sat with the apostles because he was having revelations now because he was a scholar himself you need to understand the background of paul he was a scholar he was a jewish scholar he was a pharisee he knew the text very well so with uh, his salvation experience everything fell into place for him you understand suddenly all of it made sense to him uh, the spirit of god started to dwell in him so revelation started to come to him he started to see the gospel and then he goes to the apostles to figure this out because I, they were they, they were eyewitnesses to christ he went he kind of 15 days they say he was spent time with them and he kind of discussed and got and that's where barnabas helps him in connecting okay which uh, probably uh, if it is me i would have never connected it knowing that he will be popular than me actually but anyway uh, the barnabas spirit is amazing so barnabas connects uh, paul there to the apostles the apostles spend time with paul and probably paul confirmed many of his understandings on the theology or the christology and you know with that he was established and then went back to tarsus so uh, it was basically barnabas telling uh, paul go and wait there i'll call you but actually he had to wait several i think almost 14 years or something paul waited now paul's life in tarsus itself uh, nobody knows exactly what happened but knowing the way paul was wired he wouldn't have kept silent and that's there's a nice uh, in that in that uh, in that video in that uh, movie it's so beautiful when actually barnabas comes to take paul back paul is very upset hello you told me to wait you didn't tell me to wait for 14 years or something like that very nice it's uh, that part uh, you know so uh, we need to know uh, that uh, paul was a pharisee paul understood the scriptures paul knew uh, paul was a jew who was waiting for the messiah and for having met jesus actually opened his mind and he had revelations which he verified with the eye witnesses of christ and he was clear of the gospel so he had a, a difficult more difficult task of taking the gospel to the gentiles being a jew himself and you can see the challenges all through his writings and everything in the whole process i wish all of you watched the video because then it's so much clear you know the actual incidents are so beautiful to see you know how it happened yes i, I think uh, uh, nabatia you understood where it is that's what i wanted to show yes and in the same map i saw jacob's well also i think that's where the samaritan woman met jesus yes yes, yes. Okay, so uh, you can see the timeline: AD thirty-three to thirty-six. It was Paul's conversion, his life in Damascus. He went to the Nabatean regions, fifteen days to be with uh, Peter and James in that. Then thirty-six to thirty-nine or forty, Paul's missionary activity in Tarsus and Cilicia. So there he has put it as missionary activity. Now, if you go to those parts, if you see Acts nine thirty, uh, it says that 
and when the brothers learned this uh, learned about learned this they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus um, that is the issue at Jerusalem you know, when and when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples and they were all afraid of him for they did not believe he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord and who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So that's an evidence that Paul was doing ministry in Damascus. Okay, there was a, we don't have timelines, but there were about three years he spent in Damascus, Nabatea and his 15 days journey probably at the end of those three years to Jerusalem okay and so um, he went in and out among them at Jeru uh, Jerusalem preaching boldly in the name of Jesus can you see that he, he went, while he was in Jerusalem also he preached the gospel so if you see the trend that when he was in Damascus he was preaching the gospel when he was in Jerusalem he was preaching the gospel the time in between in Nabatea would also have been preaching the gospel. So he, he was involved. That's it. It's an assumption or a speculation, but it's pretty good speculation because you see this man constantly preaching the gospel in, in uh, Acts chapter 9 verses 26 to um, 30. And then they to take him to Caesarea and take him off to because he had problems. Um, so he went in and out among Jerusalem preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. Who was this guy? Just three years back, he was uh, putting people in prison, right? So now it's like uh, the head of RSS, Mr. Muttalik, or uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, Ramsena Muttalik, suddenly coming to Christ and going and preaching among these guys the gospel. Uh, it's the same effect. In fact, you know, you better to use Muttalik than even RSS head because Muttalik is more identifiable with uh, the way Peter is, Paul was performing. So he had created enemies there and he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. But they were seeking to kill him. You notice that the way the gospel creates reactions is the same thing. If you read in uh, the gospels, uh, when Jesus was preaching to the, uh, the Jewish nation, they all wanted to kill him. I'm coming, I'm slowly figuring out if you're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the tendency and the reaction of people should be to, to kill you. <laughs> That reaction is pretty common. I mean, if you see it, all of this. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Can you see? That's the end of the record of, uh, of Paul there. Until then, Paul is uh, brought back in. Uh, Luke drops him there. And then, uh, then only in 11... Uh, 26. 11, 26 again. That you need to understand why Luke is doing that. See, so Luke is recording many issues, okay, parallel issues that are going on. So he drops one, picks up another line, and starts to give you that parallel that is going on. So it's important to put it on a time frame. So we know that AD 36 to 40, Paul's missionary activity in Tarsus and Cilicia, that means to say, I mean, not that it is recorded. Uh, Acts 9.30, you don't see anything there that is there. Uh, and if you see Galatians 1.21, let's look at Galatians 1.21. Um, and you need to keep this scripture always there because it's one of the records of uh, the, uh, the silent years of Paul. Galatians one. 21. Uh, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him for 15 days. Can you see that? Galatians 1, 18, I'm reading. You need to connect it to the timeline, the Acts timeline. Okay. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went to the, into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. That is where is Tarsus and things like that. And I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us now is preaching the faith. He once tried to destroy and they glorified God because of it. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas. Can you now see that uh, timeline? 
Now, which is that going to which is that uh, going to Jerusalem? You can see that here. Once he uh, in Acts, um, uh, after his salvation, after okay, you can come to twenty seven uh, Acts eleven and verse. Uh, 27 to the end of the uh, thing. Let me read for you. Acts 27. Then after 14, I'm trying to connect Acts, the Galatians mention of 14 years of Paul. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the spirit that there would be a great famine all over the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to the ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Now, can you connect that with the Galatians record of um, uh, where he says, then after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking, with, uh, taking Titus along with me. And I went up because our revelation said before them through privately before the uh, those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaimed. Is that the one, or it could be uh, the Jerusalem Council also? Okay, so it, it could also be Jerusalem Council in uh, um, in Acts fifteen, because if you read the Galatians record, it looks like it was probably for the defense of the gospel he was preaching to the Gentiles. So can you see that? Uh, if it is Acts 15 that we are talking about in Galatians uh, chapter 1, I mean, Galatians chapter 2, verse 1, then you are looking at uh, 14 years from which date? 14 years from AD 33 when he converted? Uh, uh, is, is it from that time or probably? The end of that. Yes, Pastor. Because see, uh, in according to this table, there is three years his conversion, and then uh, visit to Peter and James. Then again three years, and then these eight nine years. And because at the end of the table, it says journey to Jerusalem for the Apostolic Council. So that sums up to fourteen years approximately. Okay. Possible. This yeah. Table. yeah. So we have a timeline there. So we have a timeline that we can capture. So that you are able to put the book of Acts and the events of Acts on a timeline. And then you need to understand that when Paul, when, when, when Luke is writing events, he is stopping uh, Saul and starting with Peter. That doesn't mean that it is now, it is after Paul that Peter happened. Peter could also be a parallel timeline, you know. He is just writing, recording one, the other. Is that, does that make sense to all of you? I mean, does it... So in uh, in figure four, you are getting an idea of timeline. In figure three, you are getting a geographic picture. Figure three, where he talks Peter's itinerary. Uh, so Caesarea, he, he's trying to give you an idea of how much distance was there uh, in this whole uh, you know uh, space that we are working with. And of course, he goes on to show you uh, space and time um constantly so that you will understand it in the framework of when you're reading the does that make everyone make a so AD 33 to um, you're looking at around 49 uh you're looking at about 14 years probably i would say um, it was probably from 36 to 50 that we are talking about so when paul men uh, mentions in galatians chapter 1 and 14 years later it would be after you know uh, he went to um uh let's say uh, from 36 approximately so you were looking at around from that point onwards 14 years but anyway it doesn't matter but you have an approximate idea of uh the the the, the space the time frame so you are looking at from acts chapter 1 to acts chapter 15 what would be the time zone that you're looking at you're looking at around 14 15 years have transpired but when we are reading Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 15, if you're almost reading it like it happened next day, next day, next day, so you would have a feeling that it is about three weeks. Am I correct? When we read the Acts before, 
maybe three weeks to three months maybe is all the timeline that we were you know because luke is recording it as one after the other event and when we are reading the book of acts you know imagine up to the book of acts, chapter of 15 which is almost at the midway of acts we would have only looked at it as a matter of about three months three weeks to three months but now we are seeing that there is a span of 15 years 15 years that have transpired from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 15. From Pentecost to the Jerusalem Council is 15 years that has transpired. Does that change the way we think about the text? Yes, brothers and sisters. Can you see what Arthapatsya is doing? Don't you think it is important that we understand the scriptures in the time frame of distance geography and uh, uh, time especially time because geography was messed up uh, because as, as we read earlier there was not enough maps and there were a vague understanding so they constantly wrote it in a, you know in, in the geographical frame but still it makes sense still it makes sense in terms of understanding distances and things like that yes are we all okay with the time frames So the last one, eight to nine years, Paul joins Barnabas in Antioch one year, Acts 11 20, but with additional activity in the city and the regions of Syria and Phoenicia. First missionary journey to Cyprus, Cilicia, Southern Galatia, Acts 13 to 14 28, journey to Jerusalem for the Jerusalem Council. So it's very interesting. I mean, yeah, if he didn't put this uh, chart, we would never kind of figure it out, uh, that time frame, isn't it? So with that, it also gives us the time frame of the entire book of Acts up till 15. So is it 14 years or is it more than that? Because from Paul's conversion to this thing, it is saying. So the Paul's conversion probably happened somewhere 80, 33, 36, because Jesus would have been crucified and Pentecost would have been at somewhere 80, 28. Okay. So you are actually from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 16 is more than that. Time. So you should be about looking at about 18 to 20 years. I think. Are you able to get that time frame? See, we are recording Paul's conversion in AD 33, right? But Paul's conversion was significantly after, much later than the Pentecost. And we looked at uh, the birth of Jesus at somewhere at AD 4, I mean BC 4. And if you look at Jesus at 30 at baptism, would have been, at the age of 30, he was he received the baptism. We are looking at if you take it from 4 to uh, uh, 30 years, if you add 30 years, we could come to approximately around 28. So from 28 to 33 is about 5 years. So 14 plus 5 is about 19. 20 years is the time frame from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 15. And Jerusalem Council is a landmark event. Why is it a landmark event? Jerusalem? Yes, everybody needs to unmute and discuss. I know that some of you may be getting ready to go for work and you know. If you're changing dress and all, I don't, don't bother at this point. If you're cooking, you can still discuss. There's no problem. We don't mind sound. Yes, we need to engage. Otherwise, we'll change the time where we can all engage. I need all of you to engage. Otherwise, it doesn't work. We are to discuss. How do I know that you are all at the same? Uh, Pastor, you asked why was the Jerusalem Council a landmark event? Yes, yes. Okay, I think that was in many ways the acknowledgement that God in, indeed includes the Gentiles as well. Absolutely, yes. yes. Absolutely, it is, it, is the, it is the landmark event because that was the official endorsement of the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, it was the official endorsement of how the Gentiles would practice the gospel. Uh, but 
if the defense was based on all that happened before that and it's like the testimony of peter saying that the way the spirit fell upon us on the day of pentecost is the same way it fell upon the samaritans same way it fell upon the uh, the gentiles in cornelius house therefore if christ has accepted them the spirit has for why who are we to stop them you understood the whole defense that paul uh, peter uses uses there in terms of uh, is it there in uh, that or that is paul's uh, this thing defense in peter actually defends that a little earlier right in that peter's defense is a little earlier than that right or is it in the same one acts 15 is about the this circumcision and all that stuff yeah yeah um, probably peter also mentions it after yes, the it's that, it is that it, yeah acts chapter 15 it says uh the apostles and the elders gathered together in the better and after they had much debate peter stood up and said to them brothers you know that it, in the early days god made a choice among you that by the mouth of the gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe and god who knows the heart bore witness to them by giving them the spirit just as he did to us yes it is here only in it is a landmark event but all of that testimony is based on the events that have already transpired they have they have seen i mean what were the other uh, very a uh, landmark events that one is a falling of the spirit upon the gentiles and the samaritans which is evidenced by the speaking of tongues luke records it like that for us that there is acceptance okay then the other thing was stephen's message in that there was a, a what we call as a umbilical cord cutting was there what was he said god does not dwell in temples made with hands hands can you imagine telling that a jew can you can you see that that event was very strong so these events uh, are very very uh, critical to uh, to the okay let's take a short break and i'll come back short break all of you or if you'd like to continue to discuss whenever nobody is discussing only shubha me and pacha victor seems to be talking in between a few of you are speaking but i this is not how our, our our typical class should happen there should be a significant amount of discussion and arguments because and it is possible that you are not able to involve in the discussion because you have not read so you want to remain strategic silence but uh, the idea is all of us have read all of us are thinking through and all of us are contributing and that that would actually lead to the best possible learning experience that we will have Okay, we'll take our fifteen five five minutes to ten minutes break and come back.
Yes. So we are not able to engage with the conversation because we don't have an idea with the whole thing. So today, in today's discussion, we saw those maps. What did those maps tell us? The maps told that there is Judea and there is Samaria and there is Galilee. Can you imagine suddenly you kind of figure out uh, the whole idea of Jesus walking through Samaria to, uh, you know, from Galilee to Jerusalem and from Jerusalem to in which they would take another route. That's how she, he meets this Samaritan woman also. And then you, the whole framework of the, the first uh, aspect of the journey of the gospel from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 15 is kind of very clear to us when we see that maps. And then when we put it on the timeline of about 15 to 20 years, the entire time journey from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 15, you get the timeline as well as the geography of that uh, region. And that helps you to put the whole narrative in a, in a, in a reasonably good uh, you know, uh, time space framework, which gives you uh, additional support to your biblical theology that you're developing. Does that make sense? Sorry, I'll take a break again, uh, but uh, I just don't want us to miss out. I because I know that without me engaging, I don't think anybody is engaging. Shubha, um, can you take on again a little bit more in terms of? Uh, oh, Pastor, what? But what should I say about? But, uh, I mean, if you fin, you are you planning to do three point three point one and three point three point two and three point yeah. Up to 3.3.4, I have to take. Okay, you please continue. Go ahead. Okay. Sure. Okay, so now um, 3.3.1 says, um, the Christian community in Damascus was um, found probably by some Jewish Christian Hellenists who had fled Jerusalem during the persecution follow followed by um, Stephen's martyrdom. So, they began their mission in synagogues and were appealing primary, primarily to the Gentiles, God fearers who were attracted to Judaism. So that is uh, their audience. And um, uh, don't you think uh, that the story of Damascus is similar to the story of Antioch? It's interesting, right? I'll just ask you a very controversial question. The story of Antioch was very simple. Some Hellenist Jews were fleeing the persecution of Stephen and they preached the gospel at Antioch and then Antioch then became a church. Now, here it says the same thing. Some um, Hellenistic Jews uh, preached the gospel there first, right? And they founded the church there. Of course, Luke doesn't record the journey of the Damascus church, but we know that Ananias was probably an elder there. He was, uh, he was a Jew, probably a very strong Jew himself, but there was a good eldership there that he, God spoke to him and to see that uh, Paul is brought into the church and he was discipled there. And we can get uh, clear pictures of that in the record of Paul, for Paul's conversion. But you know what? Uh, we need to understand that Luke is only highlighting some of it. And that the Damascus church was probably an Antioch church equivalent. Um, in some way, Paul was sent from the Damascus church, right? In some way, Paul was sent from the Damascus church to the Nemetian region and other places, probably. We are not having records of that. So that unknown years of Paul probably was in missions, probably sent from the, the Damascus church. And... Uh, Probably that whole idea of being sent by a church and then eventually that happening when in Antioch and they're traveling from Antioch itself is also uh, a, a can, can, can be a parallel. I mean, I'm just speculatively thinking here, holy imagination. But if you see the Christian community in Damascus is probably founded by the Jewish Christian Hellenists who had fled Jerusalem during the persecution following Stephen Martin is the same story that you can see in Antioch in Acts chapter 11 also. What do you think? The Hellenists began their mission in synagogues, appealing 
primarily to the Gentiles, God fearers, who are, were attracted to Judaism. When Paul resided in Damascus, he met with a group of disciples, Acts 19, 9, 19, and personally began his own ministry of proclamation, Keriso or Kerigma, to Jews and Greek sympathizers, Acts chapter 19, 20 and 21. Eventually, they became these early Christians formed small conventicles of, of followers where messianic doctrines of Christianity, no doctrines of Christianity apart from the law were taught. So messianic con conventicles, small groups, small house churches kind of a scenario is what we are seeing there. So you can see that in Damascus, which of course is happening in Acts. Uh, where do we see that in Acts? Uh, we see it. Uh, Paul's conversion is happening. Acts, Acts 9. Acts 9. Acts 9. So, uh, Saul's conversion is happening in 9. And Saul, um, uh, yeah, from, if you read from verse uh, 19, for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying he is the son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is it not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who had called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose to bring him bound? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus, proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Their plot became known to Saul and they were watching the gates at night and kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down an opening in the wall in the basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join them. So the, the ministry of Paul in Damascus, there seems to be an established church there already. So that's a very interesting uh, picture that we are getting. So something like Antioch, which is more detailed described by Luke, the whole formation of it, uh, seems to be something that uh, happened. I mean, Damascus seems to have a similar experience much earlier because the fact that Ananias was there and he brought him to a group of disciples. Okay, give me another five, 10 minutes. I'll just drop my other daughter and come back. Uh, but uh, Shubha, please continue your discussion. Okay, I don't want to stop it because we just have another 40 to 45 minutes. Shubha, you can continue to finish that. So, um, yeah, I would like to read from the book. Uh, why Syria? I mean, because the Jews or maybe like initially, you know, before we see that Peter has this vision or before the gospel reaches the Gentiles, uh, I'm sure the Christians who would have fled um, Syria, um, traditionally, the Jews did not uh, regard it as, you know, uh, like unholy or something, because um, like what the book says, Syria, which seems to have been regarded in the sense intermediate between the land and outside the land. So it was sort of an intermediate. So, so I am sure they did not have any trouble taking the gospel there or connecting with the communities there, because traditionally before all this council happened, the discussion happened and the openness to reaching out to the Gentiles. So the term Soria or Syria does not include the country alone, but all the lands within. Uh, according to the rabbis, uh, David had subdued such as Mesopotamia, Syria, uh, Zoba, and Aklab, et cetera. So they're, they're saying we can't go in too much into details about what the geographical uh, boundaries of those are, but um, uh, they are something uh, which is distinguished from uh, Palestine proper. And, and then they were saying that if somebody could have, uh, it, there was so much favor for Syria that if uh, people could have stepped in straight from the uh, soil of Palestine um, or joint fields between the two countries without the Gentile strip, the land and dust of Syria would be considered clean, like Palestine itself. There was thus around the land a sort of an inner band consisting of those countries which had been annexed by David and termed Soria or Syria, whatever they call it. Um, but beside this, there was also what was called the outer band toward the Gentile world, consisting of Egypt, Babylon, Ammon, and Moab, the countries in which Israel had special interest and which they distinguished from the rest outside the world. So you see, like I said, in terms of holiness, first there's Jerusalem, the, which is considered the holy of holies. Then, then it's like... Um, uh, Judea and then between Samaria comes which they totally want to overstep and, and then there is Galilee which they make fun of but it's still part of the holy land then there is Syria this outer band uh, this inner band then there is this outer band consisting of uh, 
uh, like Egypt, Babylon, and others, which in which Israel has special interest. And then there is the rest of the outside world. So that was the thing how they distinguished in those times in terms of holiness. So uh, like um, Damascus being part of Syria and um, all those regions. So I'm sure they were not too averse to going there. And now reading from uh, our article. Um, okay. So yeah, Pastor read up till uh, that part where uh, they said uh, messianic doctrines and Christianity apart from the law were taught. So um, then Paul's message, it was successful, but also controversial. And then the Jews, as we know here, and the reference is Acts 9.23, uh, it, it was found irritating to the Jews and they started plotting his death. And then he is lowered down the wall and then um, his fellow believers, and then he escapes. And um, then he made, uh, it's saying, uh, we can suspect that Paul had numerous contacts with this Damascus church. And um, it's giving a reference between uh, 37 and 47 to 48 AD. So like um, those, those years where we are saying that Paul has joined Barnabas and all that. So between all those years and also in his activities in Tarsus, Tarsus and Sicilia, that time, uh, that time frame, he, he's having contacts with the people in Damascus church. And then uh, it's saying Paul's ministries in Damascus. Now it's describing he stayed three years in Damascus and Arabia. That is the Nabataean kingdom before he was forced to flee. And, and when we say he was forced to flee because of these tensions, um, the article says he was still an active missionary. And, and we should not assume that he lived in uh, isolation, solitude, and meditation. And in fact, he was proclaiming and preaching in the synagogues, hoping to reach his own people through the gospel. But it, it became very evident uh, as, as we keep on reading. Whenever he preached in synagogues, um, he was more successful with God-fearers, which is the Gentiles. In, in these synagogues. And um, then uh, it says about this 15 day visit to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, we, we've already seen the overview of all this in the table. And um, there he conferred with Peter and James. And he's saying uh, now that he's a missionary loner so far. And now he's wanting to make contact with the group of apostles and uh, the spokesman, which is like Peter for the young Jesus community in the holy city. So even in Peter and Paul movie, if you guys will see, this is shown how he, he's, he's really hungry to know because uh, he knows that uh, Peter, James and other, others uh, have uh, first-hand experience and they've been with Christ. So, so he really wants to know and, and they're not uh, very open to receiving him because you know they, they suspect and the things they've done initially and James. But then uh, he wants to gather valuable information about Jesus and uh, the significance of his life, his teaching, and his death. So uh, Jesus stood at the center of these conversations, though we do not see that many details in, the, in Acts, but that is what um, this article uh, is telling us in details. And some of the traditions that Paul received and, and were handed down to the communities like uh, Corinthians, Thessalonians, and others, they come from this visit. So... Um, this is very significant. The time is brief. It's 15 day visit, it says in, in Jerusalem, but um, the, the writer here is saying, it, we should not, uh, the, the briefness of the time should not uh, reduce the significance of uh, the visit because Paul's the theology, which eventually finds full expression in his letters to the different churches, um, it was formed here as a result of this interaction. Now uh, we go to, I think this is the last part. Yes, uh, Paul was in Tarsus. So Tarsus is his hometown. And then uh, Luke is uh, considerably silent about uh, Paul's stay in Tarsus and it's puzzling. But as we read in the upper uh, thing, where he's, he's uh, in isolation, uh, he's not in isolation. And we shouldn't assume that if he's fled for safety, uh, he was still um, preaching and proclaiming the gospel. And, and again, the statement says, um, Paul certainly proclaimed the gospel in his hometown of Tarsus and the, uh, the like nearby region of Sicilia for three years. That is AD 36 to um, AD, uh, yeah, 36 to 38 or 40, something like that. And um, the Christian, commun Christian communities were, as a result of his preaching, Christian communities were established in Tarsus and neighboring cities, uh, like we said, uh, Sicilia is one of them, and, and the surrounding areas. 
and most of the christian communities here were consisting of jews or gentiles who began the religious quest so they were searching already for god in the synagogues and as a result like paul used to preach in these synagogues and these gentiles and and maybe some jews also uh, who were already in the synagogue they converted and um, so he's saying uh, why is this uh, significant so there's twofold significance because Paul was actively engaged in mission after his conversion. He did not merely sit around waiting for heavenly vision. So now that he has, uh, so I think that is one one uh, nice key or or some important point that though he didn't he he uh, after he was converted he didn't wait for another vision. He's already had a vision. He's converted. So now he's continuing to go on preaching and and despite persecution and despite not having another direct revelation, he's still continuing on the mission. And it's saying it's making a statement here that his success in Tarsus probably was the main reason because in the table, the third column, it says now Barnabas has invited him to join him for the challenge in Antioch. And, and as you know, now, now they're moving farther and farther out into from the Holy Land, the inner band, outer band, and, and Syria and other places. Now they're moving to Antioch. And until when Antioch starts is, is the end of, of what they consider like their own land and uh, that and, and ter the territory. And after that, it, it's actually the, the rest of the outer world. So um, uh, that's the challenge they're facing in Antioch. And Paul's missionary activities uh, began before, definitely we know, before his call to Antioch. And then his first visit to Asia Minor with Barnabas. And, and, and then uh, after this, he goes to, uh, for the further expansion in the agency. Um, and then it is extremely significant all these years for the church, as well as Paul's theological development and maturity. So one by one, he's going, he's reaching out and, and then it's uh, leading to like what we see when maybe when we study Pauline and we'll see all the letters and stuff. So this is all his formative years where he's picking up theology and, and the traditions that he's handing down to others and, and maybe developing his own character. Thank you. If anybody has any questions or, or something, please let me know. Uh, yes, sister, I have a question. Uh, how, is, uh, how about uh, Paul's life before uh, uh, Damascus? Actually, he was actually uh, learning from Kamaliel. And yeah. uh, do you know about something or do uh, you have any information about that? So, uh, brother, give me some time. I will search for information right now. I don't have because I didn't read. And in this book, they're only telling about Jewish life. But I'm sure um, if I find something, I will send it in the group. Okay, okay. Mr. Pastor, there is actually a, a question is that you would have heard about that. That is actually Paul is not married and all. Is it right, Pastor? Or some, some of them are saying like that. But actually, the person who's writing in First Corinthians uh, about the ma marriage life and all, I don't th think like that. But uh, some arguments, some people are saying that Paul is not married and all. So I just want to know about that. I am not uh, you know, so sure uh, because uh, there is no clarity as to whether he was married or not. Only reference I think he makes is, uh, uh, you know, uh, as other apostles, do we, uh, you know, even we have the right to get married. That is the only statement he talks in support of marriage and all. So there is, I think, uh, no proof whether he was married or not married. Nowhere. Uh, maybe Pastor George, if you know anything on that. Oh, we came to uh, Paul's marital life. Huh? Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, Pastor, uh, Pastor George, actually, here in uh, Tamil Nadu, uh -huh. some arguments already there. Uh, so many uh -huh. years. Uh, actually, some of them saying that Paul is not married. Since actually, uh, as Shubha was uh, speaking about uh, Paul's life, Paul's ministry, I uh -huh. uh, had this question again remembering. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, he was, he, while he was uh, reaching Dam uh, Damascus, 
uh, he was not saved. He was uh, learning all the scriptures from Gamaliel. Am I right, Pastor? But, uh, uh, yeah, he was trained under Gamaliel. It's like Harvard of uh, our current uh, generation. He was in Harvard. Trained in Harvard. So he was in that level, yes. Princeton, Harvard, that that leg, that legacy. Uh, so if, if you want to know about Paul's uh, uh, marital life, um, now I'll take you to First Corinthians seven. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have a sexual relationship with a woman. Imagine if you read that and stopped there. It have been a very uh, difficult proposition, right? And that's how we read the Bible always, right? Imagine uh, I'm speaking at a marriage uh, ceremony and my message is based on 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. If I only touch that. Now, good. that's what I'm also saying, but uh, without going to Metro Pali, yeah. I cannot uh, give guidance to people to travel to the place. So only a person who's married can uh, teach something like that. Correct. But Paul also had revelation. So that the, the mystery mystery was revealed to him and uh, the, uh, the, the plan of the church was given to him. That is one aspect. But let's look at this. Now, now imagine if you read this passage at a wedding ceremony and stopped it there. The groom would actually get up from there where he's sitting and come and beat you up, right? <laughs> but because of temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman has her own husband. Do you think that is what Paul is trying to tell here? That marry only for sexual pleasure? Come on, marriage has a whole is its origins in the creation order. And definitely Paul is addressing, see, you can see here now concerning the matters which you wrote. Now, we don't have that letter with us, isn't it? We don't have that letter with us. So, Paul is addressing some other issue, which we'll have to speculate because it is evident from what he's issuing. He so, it is not that, you know, you should marry to fulfill your sexual pleasure. That's not the idea of marriage. Okay. The idea of marriage is uh, one flesh, which was there in the Garden of Eden. When God created man, when mankind, he created them as a composite being. Uh, in uh, in uh, day six and together they reflected the image of God. Then God separates the woman from the man and brings back in the marriage. And that concept of one flesh is the idea of one flesh. Not a, One flesh is not even a sexual union. The one flesh idea is when they were created originally, it was, he was a, they were a composite being. Okay. So uh, the, the idea of marriage has much more deeper meaning than just what Paul is addressing here. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her con husband. And if you go to a court or family court, that's what they would say even today, isn't it? Okay. For the wife does not have authority of, over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do we ever teach this in church? But don't you think that is so powerful, that teaching? Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer and then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of a lack of self-control. Now, as a concession, not a, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as myself I am. But each one has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. So as I am, you know, we are speculating that Paul is talking about celibacy, celibacy life. And he's considering that as a gift. Now we talk about all the Holy Spirit gifts, but we don't talk about this particular gift, right? <laughs> <laughs> all of us want tongue and prophecy, but not deliver. If we speak this, the youth will throw the stones on us first. Yeah, it's very interesting. But look at what Paul did. To the unmarried and the widows, I say, to the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. To the unmarried and the widows. What is that? Unmarried and the widows. But so you mean to say that actually he's speaking through, uh, through the revelation given by the Spirit, Pastor Holy Spirit? No, 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 no. I'm just take, taking you through a journey, just because you know it's a very interesting discussion. It's the most, one of the most controversial discussions. Paul's marital life. 
possible potential marital life. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, or it is better to marry than to burn a passion. Now, can you tell this, is that a teaching Paul is giving to the unmarried as in the singles who are just before they're married? Hey guys, all of you are meant to be celibate. Is that what he's talking about? Is that what the idea that God generally in the text talks about? It is, it is God's plan that all should be married, right? Do we all agree with that? That is God's great plan that people should be in families? Not everybody must. Why, why brother? No, some of them are called to be like... Uh, not just generally. Generally, the plan is not celibacy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. But Paul is speaking from a specific place. So when, when he says to the unmarried and the widows, I can, I can I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. Does that make sense? Is that unmarried people who are singles? That means uh, pre-married. I mean, imagine there are many in this group also now. Can I tell this, preach to them and say, um, all of you who are unmarried here, that includes Jason, Susan, Alrina, you know, all of you guys, even Angel is there. And, uh, okay, Shuba is there. So I can say to them like this now. You see, this is what Paul is saying to the unmarried. Of course, unmarried are there. And the widows, maybe none of us here are widows at this point. I say that it is good for them, uh, good for you to remain single as I am, as Paul was. Is that a good teaching to give? Is that a balanced teaching? Is that what Paul is trying to tell them? Something wrong, right? But after marriage, I think this is good teaching. Us. Come again, come again. Now after marriage and several years, hmm. now I think it is a good teaching because whoever wants to do ministry, uh. it is not uh, easy to balance the family and ministry. Oh, Pastor, I will... Uh, absolutely disagree. Paul, okay, can I can I argue, sister, Pastor, just for the sake of argument, okay? Just yes, for the sake of argument. Uh, I want to, uh, because that's a common statement we hear, uh, but if you read 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1 onwards, when you look at the qualities of an overseer, can you read it and tell me what it is? Yes, yes. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1 onwards. All the way down up to uh, five. Anybody can read, no problem. All of you who are in class. First Timothy 3, Pastor, it is one. Yeah. This is a faithful saying if a man desires the portion of a bishop, he, should, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be a blameless, the, the husband of, a, of one wife. Okay, Emperor. can I stop it there? What do you think now? Yes. yes. What's, but, Paul's, what's Paul's intention that we should do ministry without marriage? It's true, Pastor, but uh, even in a TPM church and a Roman Catholic church, people are without marriage now, Pastor. Pastor. Pastor, we cannot refer to a contemporary paradigm. We have to, we have to refer to the apostolic paradigm, the early church paradigm, which is our basis. And also, uh, Paul also saying that one who is who's married is actually pleasing his wife. One is not married, is actually fully dedicated to the Lord and he uh, pleasing oh, no, the Lord. No, Pastor, Pastor, you are reading all of those texts out of context. But when this is a general instruction Paul is giving to Timothy, who is an apostolic team member, who he is deputed uh, in Ephesus, he's deputed him in different places. And when he is telling Timothy, Timothy, when you are choosing an, uh, a, a leader over the church, you need to see that he's a married guy. Yes, sir. that's true. So the idea that, you know, if I was not married, I can do ministry. But let me tell you, if we are doing ministry that is not balancing with our marriage, then our ministry is not something that God will accept. It is outside the will of God. The marriage is one of the best checks for our ma uh, ministry life. Okay, let's go a little more down. You can see 
the husband of one wife sober minded self controlled respectable hospitable and able to teach not a drunkard not a violent but gentle not quarrelsome not a lover of money he must manage his own household well with all dignity keeping his children submissive that means he must be a father also can you see not just a husband but a father too then he says for if someone does not know how to manage his own household how will he care for the the house of god or the god's church so the check for him to be an elder or a leader over a congregation is that he is able to have a excellent marital life excellent uh, family life am i correct does that change our paradigm now if you come back to uh, chapter 7 first corinthians and he says now to the unmarried and the widows i say to you that is the best to remain single does it contradict now what i am trying to say here the word unmarried there is not the way we understand as the singles theologians and scholars say that it is to the unmarried and the widows it is actually for men who the idea of widowers which we have in our context the the greco roman culture or the jewish culture refer to them as unmarried you understood the concept anybody does that make sense this is like a revelation george Hey, yeah, yeah, we just work. Work, first yeah. level. I like the revival. I just see <laughs> the video comes on and you come on. I am well out. <laughs> the topic made him to come back. I think. First level, I am happy. This the subject about revival. But let's just work. I mean, just work with me on the text. Let's right? just look at the text. I mean, it would Paul who says that you you want to be a leader of a church, you should be a good husband and a good father. Would he say to singles? Hey guys, I don't want you to get married like I'm, uh, and be like I want you to be like me. Does that make sense? It doesn't make sense. So when you look at that text to the unmarried and the widows, I say it is basically telling or to all the men who are widows and the women who are widows. I would suggest, okay, that I would. It is good for them to remain single as I am. Can you see that Paul was probably a widow over there? There is a huge potential there. We cannot say for arguing it as a hundred percent shot, but a lot of theologians are saying that he probably ha had a wife, and probably she passed away, and he was a widow, and therefore he had a pretty good, like Pastor Satish said, good understanding of what marriage was. and this is my conclusion after years about close to uh, at least uh, 20 years of 22 years of married life and ministry life any ministry that takes you away from your marriage and your primary role as father and husband is not a ministry that is in the plan of god the best check of your ministry is your family life that's what paul uses there you look at first timothy that ah, is... yes pastor satish um pastor sorry do i just only for argument actually even the teachings of jesus and teachings of paul is totally different when jesus is speaking actually uh, when he was in the world he said uh, whoever is leave his wife children uh, father mother he was speaking like that but paul actually while, uh, while teaching the person who is not looking after his family is not uh, worthy to look after the church so it is don't uh, totally contradict uh... good, good question good question now when jesus said to leaves his father mother and this thing the understanding is not if you re read it in context it is not about leaving your husband or wife because he is very clear divorce is uh, against the plan of god okay is divorce is against the plan of god that is a very clear teaching that jesus is having so jesus cannot contradict himself right so when he is talking about it he is saying in terms of your following of him it is important that your allegiance is primarily to me and your every aspect of your dimension of your life comes under lordship to me 
and under jesus lordship you would be the best husband that you it is not about uh you know leaving the father mother and all of this things it's not that context that we're talking about because uh we we do not have a full revelation of the gospel we do not have a full understanding of the gospel we get stuck in some of these uh, i i was struggling with this particular text a lot it is not it is not about leaving a, a, a husband or leaving a wife and children and going for ministry that he's talking there if you read that passage very clearly he is talking about the primary allegiance that if G, if you are following jesus should be to jesus and to what he says is lordship and the lordship of jesus is very clear that you should take care of your wife you should take care of your children that's your primary commitment and how do you get that because it is jesus who revealed the teachings that has to be taught to the church to the apostles and you read the apostolic teachings it's very clear what we are supposed to do with regard to marriage and when jesus actually addresses the issue of marriage he says please refer to moses am i correct when jesus addresses marriage he always says please refer to moses have you seen that yes boss why does he refer to moses what is he meaning by refer to moses does jesus quote the verse uh, a man shall leave his father and mother and does jesus quote that verse can you get that text no what i see is actually the since israelites they always give importance to moses so that's why he is also referring to moses no actually there is another reason why he is referring to moses okay uh, can you get that verse where jesus is talking about marriage so one second somewhere in uh, matthew 23 can you read it pastor Uh, Jesus addresses marriage at several points. Matthew nineteen. Matthew nineteen five. Yeah, let's just read that. It's very interesting. Okay. Now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and in, entered the region of Judea beyond Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him, asking, "Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause?" He answered, "Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Where is he going to?" Can you tell me where he is going to? Genesis. Said, Genesis. The Moses. That is Moses. And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give certificate of divorce to and to send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of your heart, Moses. Allowed you to divorce your wife, but from the beginning it was not so. From when? From beginning, okay. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. The disciple said to him, "If such is the case of a man and with his wife, it is better not to marry." Can you see the angle that is coming? But he said to him, "Not every man one can receive this thing, but only those whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth." And there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. Can you see some angles of uh, intersex and LGBT coming angle here? Just, just work along. Don't work. Don't, don't go through into that. Uh, and eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who are being made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. That the one who is able to receive this receive it. This passage is wonderful when you want to discuss about homosexuality. Also, Jesus is actually addressing that here in some extent. Okay, um, homosexuality. I'm not. I'm talking about in, in talking about intersex primarily, which we call as transgender. Is not the right word to use the people. It is intersex is the right word, and you can see that there are some by births. Okay, 
we have to address that in a different setting and hopefully somebody will bring the topic and we will someday later argue on that but now coming back to the idea of marriage if jesus says that if you not only this time another time also i think about uh, another story where he comes the same issue he will tell them to refer to moses and that means to say jesus says i have nothing further to teach because moses has already taught it and i am not changing anything marriage is as per genesis chapter 1 and on the 6th day god made family not man do you agree i know that we all would have a paradigm shift here at this point on the 6th day god made not man family how many of you would agree with me that he made family if family is in the creation order we cannot tamper with that now moses is giving license or divorce it is it is to protect the woman because in that culture a woman had no value but if she carried it carried a certificate of divorce it would state that this is the reason so that the woman would have a reasonably safe environment so that is something to do if you study their culture you will understand why moses gave that divorce certificate but jesus is saying that's not what is all about it is the hardness of your heart that actually causes these issues okay and he refers to uh, genesis the creation order uh, marriage you see so if you were to go back to first corinthians chapter 7 and then look at the text very interestingly very deeply and you know actually analyze it paul would it teach against getting married because it was in the in the primary uh, area of our life which is designed by god that we should exist in marriage we should live in marriage we should uh, experience life in marriage here paul is addressing uh, widows men and women and paul says you know if that's the case hey guys why don't you stay like i am i am a guy who lost my wife and i have decided not to get married for the gospel sake does that make sense i think this is correct first does that change our entire paradigm at least we could go through what paradigm shift today says yes what do you think others all the dear young ones here asalamu what do you say you agree with me in this i mean at least to to a very yeah yes 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 dr george that makes a lot of lot of sense so when you read first corinthians 7 we need to see that there is something that the corinthian church has written to him and he is writing it in that context it Correct. had to do with widows actually it had to do with people who lost their wives and they had to remarry and that was the issue there the issue of temptation and this thing he says okay if you are overcome by temptation get married man correct so he was talking also in the context of ministry ministry in that context where there was severe persecution there was an anti christian movement and in that context you know you wouldn't be able to manage marriage again instead of that why don't you focus on the kingdom as i am doing he said i just love it i mean that's i think to change the way we look at marriage okay now coming back to um, pastor satish i think we we uh, we've done a pretty reasonable good justice to uh, paul's marital life and fa- once and for all delivered paul <laughs> from all the judgments that we will have or till then okay good uh, so coming back to what shubha was talking to us it's uh, i'm hoping that all of you have from uh, acts chapter 1 to acts chapter 15 got the timeline got the events that are progressing you should have it in your mind always what is happening in each chapter so my suggestion would be to create a chart like we have that chart done by that guy what is that what are the what are the name of that cup uh, hengel and uh, shwena that similarly you can create a chart like this i'll close with this okay short short session
and you can put this chart in your competency too. Uh, so that will uh, really help uh, the evaluator, the assessor to kind of figure out that you have done good biblical theology. Okay, so you can do uh, like this, Acts chapter 1, Acts 2, Acts 3, Acts 4, Acts 5. Act six, Act seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and up to fifteen. So if you divide it nicely, then you can write timeline, timeline here. Okay. So you can put approximately times of these events and you can see the main figure main figure put the main figure in each of these chapters some of these chapters are transitional so it will transition between uh peter and stephen and stephen and paul i mean like that it will transition but there's no problem if it is transition you can put both the names then you can put the geography you can tell about the geography now that you have seen the maps, the geography will make sense. And so you have timeline, you have a main figure, and you have the geography. Then the main event. So you can do this as a chart of, you, know, you don't need to do a big chart like this. You can do it, uh, chap, uh, you know, since we have 28 chapters, you can do it uh, in a, a rounding off to 30. You can do it 5555. Five, five, five. Or you can do it uh, with other marks, like the block, the six blocks that we talked about, isn't it? But ideally, my suggestion would be because we are all stuck in the uh, chapter paradigm and the verse paradigm because it was, it is there right now, and we refer primarily to Bible from the chapter and verse paradigm. But you know, the early church people did not have that. They did not have verses, right? There was no chapters. Chapters were put in the 12th century. Uh, verses were put in the 16th century. Okay. So, uh, but for us, because we are so aware of the chapter verse paradigm, it's good to do it, you know, Acts uh, 1 to 5 or 1 to 10 in 1. Then uh, that means if you put it in uh, uh, landscape, your uh, MS Word in landscape and create a uh, insert a, uh, a tableau column, you can insert it and make it big and make it to a wonderful thing and main events, you can say, and then you can talk about learning, primary learning, you can say, okay, so you can write the primary learning that you got. So if you were to put it like this, uh, first is the timeline, and then you wrote the main figure or the main heroes of the uh, that particular chapter, the geography where it was happening, the events, the main events that happened, and your learning there in short. I'm talking about you know just three words, four words kind of a thing. You would get an excellent biblical theology perspective. Does that make sense? Now you can create this chart, and you can use that uh, Engel and Schwenner's idea of creating that timeline chart. This would be a timeline chart. This would be an event chart. This would be the, 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 the transition from different heroes. You would see then if you can create all the 28 in one page, it's good, but it's very, very difficult. You won't be able to space it. But if you can do 10, 10 and 8 would be ideal. And you could put this uh, on your print it and put it on your uh, study area and put it across that we can see the whole acts uh, 1 to 28 in one panoramic picture. Trust me, you would be better than a scholar. Can we do that? Would some, some of us be able to present that in the next class? That, does that exercise, would that exercise really open your mind to see the uh, intent, Lucan intent in the whole Acts thing? 
by the way you are very clear we are very clear that you should have read the book of acts completely through and through you should have read read patsia you should have watched the uh, bible project outline videos and you should have watched at least one movie preferably you watch pop for peter and paul or the uh, the acts movie this much you should have done and if you can do this chart it will additionally help you to make and if you can really do a big nice chart and uh, you know stick it in your room and you can all show us show us a picture of that how it looks it will be really nice it will be very encouraging and i assure you if you do that exercise which i told you now you will never forget the acts in your life and you can i can wake you up from sleep and you can preach a sermon in a day all right printo if you are there could you just pray and close sure pastor loving heavenly father lord thank you jesus thank you lord for giving us uh, this morning lord to come together in your presence and to learn together father lord lord um, as we are aligned with your word lord you help us lord to have our discipline and also to lord to be faithful to while studying this uh, chapters and also to reflect it in our ministry father lord and you help us lord each and every one lord uh, in following lord uh, uh, your way your path father lord as well as to be uh, to be uh, faithful with the, the course that which we have undertaken father lord lord uh, in the coming days lord help us lord to have more um, insight on to what we are learning and also to help us to build uh, a strong foundation of our ministry father lord lord uh, submitting all those people lord who were not able to attend today's class also in your might hands lord you help them you bless them and also you help them to keep in track father lord uh, surrendering all of our prayer requests for second in your might hands we give you glory we give you honor in jesus most precious name we pray amen 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 god bless you all i'm hoping that all of you would read and come next time so we can engage in discussion i mean today i mean it was out of topic but i think whatever pastor satish asked and you know we discussed there was some engagement and we could you know go through the process of paradigm shift and at least i saw revival in pastor lemu coming on to video and speaking <laughs> i'm excited okay all right god bless you all